everyone happy invasion day and welcome to the news agenda with me fleet street fox and today i'm joined by labor's shadow armed forces minister luke pollard morning luke good morning uh, you're fresh from julia hartley brewer's radio show so from the ridiculous to the sublime luke. <laughs> now, this is the people's paper review so get into the comments ask us your questions the best ones get the news agenda mug so what have we got today well the mirror has splashed on the dirty russian money that's swilling around the uk and calls from keir starmer yesterday to do more to root it out so after russia invaded ukraine boris johnson announced sanctions against five banks and three people but there are as many as 50 well-known oligarch trustees in the uk whose assets should be frozen some say so luke can you tell us what happened yesterday in parliament Explain these sanctions to us. Are they weak? I think they are, uh, to be honest. I mean, what we've seen over the last week is the government say that if Russia uh, invades Ukraine, which they now have, then we'll have a serious set of sanctions put in place immediately. What we saw in the House of Commons yesterday was the Prime Minister announce uh, sanctions against five small Russian banks and three oligarchs that we now know were already sanctioned by the Americans for many years. Well, it's a start and Labour backed those initial sanctions. But what we want to see is stronger sanctions now, because if we are to deter any further Russian aggression and send a message to President Putin that uh, the West, uh, Britain and our allies will stand with Ukraine and our NATO friends from uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Bulgaria and Poland and Romania as well, then we need stronger sanctions. That means going after not just the small Russian banks, but the big ones, the, the financial institutions that Putin banks with, that bankroll the Russian state, that support the oligarchs' business empires on a global basis. We need further measures to stop that sea of dirty money flowing uh, throughout our politics. And as a country, Britain's got this unique role here because we are the only country in the world that has the city of London here. And so we've got... In the city of London, sadly, uh, a reputation for laundering uh, dirty money from Russia, the proceeds of the, cr uh, the criminal uh, enterprises that Putin and his gang of oligarchs undertake. So it is our special responsibility to go further uh, to tackle that dirty money in our financial system and sadly in our politics as well. And that's what many MPs on the opposition side, but also on the government's own benches, we're expecting, and in the debate that followed that statement, I'm afraid there were very, very few MPs, if any, on any side of the chamber that said what the government's announced is sufficient, because it's clearly not. And that's why Labour's been calling for stronger sanctions now, excluding Russia from the international payment system that's based in the West, uh, stronger sanctions against not just a couple of oligarchs, but a whole, uh, the whole kleptocracy, the, the whole institution that keeps Putin afloat, 
and further measures to stop the disinformation and the propaganda that's coming out of the Kremlin. That is a strong set of measures. That's what we were all expecting. And that's what we still need. So government needs to play catch up and play catch up to support the get to the same level as our friends in the EU and our friends in the United States did yesterday, because they've announced stronger sanctions than the UK has. And the best way of keeping that united pressure that united front against Putin is to make sure that we're in lockstep uh, in, 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 with all our allies so there is not a, a, a single um, a difference between our approaches and the UK needs to play catch up on that and fast. Well, maybe we're already having an impact because we've had our first bot sign in from St. Petersburg uh, and it's talking absolute gibberish. So obviously someone's not put a ruble in the meter. Morning, Mike. <laughs> um, maybe that's having an impact already. Who knows? Now, here's a clip from Keir Starmer's speech to Parliament yesterday. We must be prepared to go further. I understand the tactic of holding back sanctions on Putin and his cronies to try to deter an invasion of the rest of Ukraine. But a threshold has already been breached. A sovereign nation has been invaded in a war of aggression based on lies and fabrication. If we do not respond with a full set of sanctions now, Putin will once again take away the message that the benefits of aggression outweigh the costs. So we will work with the Prime Minister and our international allies to ensure that more sanctions are introduced. Russia should be excluded from financial mechanisms like SWIFT, and we should ban trading in Russian sovereign debt. Putin's campaign of misinformation should be tackled. Russia today should be prevented from broadcasting its propaganda around the world. And we should work with our European allies to ensure that Nord Stream 2 pipeline is cancelled. So that's what Keir Starmer was saying in Parliament yesterday. Now, Steve there uh, is saying, uh, if Putin successfully invades and occupies Ukraine, what next? Will he look at other areas? Look, we know that Putin did this to Georgia years ago. He did it to Crimea in 2014. He does this. He's got this playbook where he, he encourages the separatists. He sends in Ajahn provocateurs. He invades on a pretext and then retires with a land grab. It destabilizes from his point of view, an ex-Soviet neighbour which was moving towards democracy, which is a worrying habit of being infectious. Um, and we're going to, you know, we have let him do this before. We're obviously going to let him do it again, aren't we? Well, that's what he's banking on. Um, and we have seen this before. We've seen it when uh, President Putin rolled his uh, forces into the Crimea, which is part of Ukraine uh, and eastern Ukraine in 2014. Um, and we will see it uh, in his threats that he's making to many of our uh, EU and NATO allies. Um, it's worth remembering that in the speech that President Putin made, his long rambling, sometimes a little bit worrying speech, shall we say, uh, a couple of days ago, he not only denied the statehood of Ukraine, he also denied the statehood of Finland. And Finland, of course, gained independence from Russia in 1917. But this argument that he's, he's suggesting that those countries that were once under the Kremlin's control should be again, well, that is deeply dangerous. It's dangerous because it suggests that the, his target list, as Steve's question suggests, isn't just uh, the, uh, the so-called breakaway uh, regions of Ukraine, it's other nations as well. And that's one of the reasons why, as well as strong sanctions against Russia, we need to make sure that we are supporting our NATO and our EU allies um, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe to make sure that their democracy, their sovereignty, their ability to choose their own governments and to lead their life free from uh, Russian aggression is preserved. And that's why we already have UK armed forces uh, in those countries uh, backing our allies. We don't have uh, fighting forces in Ukraine and we won't have fighting forces in Ukraine, but we will keep supporting uh, our allies. And that is something that needs to be uh, it reiterated on a cross-party basis repeatedly to, so President Putin can be in no doubt that the West will stand with not just Ukraine, but with our NATO allies as well. That's a strong message that we need to keep hearing and keep repeating because President Putin is gambling on us being weak, on the West being divided, on the response being partial or indifferent, turning a blind eye to his actions. No more. 
no more. We've got to make a stand because there are people who are alive today who will be dead in the coming weeks because of Russian aggression. And they are our allies. And I think it's now time for the West to show strength and support for democracy and for decent values and against that type of aggression, warmongering and oppression that we will get uh, if President Putin uh, land grabs any more of our allies' uh, allies' countries. It seems like we're taking our lead a lot from Joe Biden. He's moved his troops as well into Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, which are NATO countries, but has said he's absolutely not going to send troops into Ukraine to protect it. It's not a NATO country and it would lead to World War Three. So that in answer to Steve's question, um, you know, he, hopefully he won't go any further. But what he does take, he's going to take, I imagine. Now, Mike says, good morning, Mike. Is Johnson too concerned with protecting his job to concern himself with Russian money or too involved in the money? Now, there's this suggestion, isn't there, Luke, and Labour's going to make hay with it, that Russian money feeds the Tory party. That is somehow why they're reluctant to do more. Uh, or is this because of Joe Biden's strategy? You know, to do that's his plan is to have a few sanctions now. And then if if uh, if Putin does more, if he invades further and deeper into Ukraine, then do a few more and then a few more. Always have something in reserve so you can ratchet up the pressure. What are the flaws in that plan? Why would that not be a good idea? Well, it sounds good in paper, doesn't it? The idea of ratcheting up your sanctions. And actually, it's it normally is good diplomatic uh, playbook that you start off uh, uh, with one set of measures and you escalate to if your opponents uh, are, don't do what they're supposed to do in that pressure. The problem is here is we know that President Putin is already insulated from many of these sanctions. Uh, he's already been preparing for the impact of Western sanctions. He's already under sanctions from 2014, which is the reason why these slow, cautious early steps need to be replaced with swift, comprehensive and serious sanctions straight away. Because we know that uh, Putin uh, prides himself on being a hard man. One of these kind of like, you know, awful kind of like 20th century hard men uh, uh, leaders that we thought we'd seen the end of, but sadly we've seen much more of in recent years. And so he, wrote, he will only understand strength. So that's why we've got to be strong coming back. And, and you're right, you know, there is far too much dirty Russian money, not just in London's property market, not just in London's financial institutions, but in our politics. In the last few years, the Conservative Party has accepted over £2 million in donations from Russian donors. And in the elections bill that they're trying to get through the House of Commons at the moment, they're going to make it easier for people who are foreign nationals to donate to political parties. This seems all wrong. I want to see our politics cleaned up. Frankly, it's far too dirty and broken at the moment. But getting rid of dirty rubles, dirty Russian money from our politics is not only good for politics in general and our democracy, it's absolutely vital for our national security now that we take steps to do so. And so that's why we not only need to see strong sanctions uh, against Russia, but if we clear ourselves up, if we clean our own house, if we make sure that Britain is no longer a home for money laundering, dirty Russian money and uh, Russian oligarchs to, uh, to make, their, make their billions go even further, then actually that puts immense pressure under the stability of the Putin regime, because at the moment he stays in power because he's floating on a sea of corruption and crime and dirty money. So that's what we have to attack as well. And we can do that. In fact, actually, there are very few countries in the world that can do what we can do, because there's only one global financial centre, and it's here in the UK, in London. It's our responsibility to do it, and we should be doing it now. Well, I'm old enough to remember, though, Luke, Theresa May being warned about Russian donors and mm. Russian money laundering and Russian purchases of multi-million pounds worth of London properties through offshore shell companies. There's nothing been done about it for quite a long time. The golden visa scheme that she introduced, which means if you pay the government a seven-figure bung, you get a passport, only ended last week, and the Russians have yeah. been making hay with that. And on pages four or five in the mirror today, there's a big investigation about Eaton Square in London. London, where you have 30 million pound homes bought by Russian cronies of Putin. And the belief is that this is money held in trust for him by friends, ultimately controlled by him. But as Vanessa Everett asks us there, what impact is this going to have on most of us? We could say, well, there's going to be sanctions and you're going to try and go after the Russian money and the multimillionaires and the oligarchs. How is that going to impact us? This war in Ukraine what impact is it going to have on, for example, the energy crisis and fuel prices, things like that? Well, 
It's a very fair question from Vanessa here, and it's an important one because what happens in Ukraine might seem like a very long way away, but it's not because if we allow Russian aggression to destabilize sovereign and democratic countries, then Putin will roll into the next one. And that means affecting peace and stability in Europe and across the world. There are other powers internationally, China, for instance, looking at what the West's reaction is to Russian aggression to see what they can get away with themselves. So it does matter. But we also need to recognize that we need to make ourselves safer during this. And the energy crisis that we're experiencing at the moment, the high prices for oil and gas that's leading to so many of the problems that families are facing, not being able to afford ever surging energy bills, is all linked. Now, the UK doesn't get as much of our gas from Russia as, say, Germany does. And it's really important that I think we need to become more energy independent because we not only need to be replacing Russian gas with renewable energy, we need to be making sure that we're decarbonizing, we're creating more jobs here. And if we do that, then we deny President Putin one more lever, one more point of control. Now, our friends in Germany, for instance, are much more reliant on Russian gas than the UK is. And the pipeline uh, that Russia is building between uh, Russia and Germany, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, is something that the Russian, um, uh, Russian government's really keen on because it keeps Germany addicted to Russian gas and keeps their power over them. Now, the new German chancellor uh, yesterday announced that they would be stopping that pipeline. Now, that is a strong move from Germany's new chancellor that sends a very strong message to Russia. Now, we need to do the equivalent of um, of stopping the Nord Stream 2, and that is dealing with the dirty money in the city of London. Only Germany could deal with Nord Stream 2, and only the UK can deal with the city of London. It's our turn to take responsibility for what we can do to stop Putin's levers of control. But ultimately, the longer we're reliant on energy as, uh, as, as Western democracies from some unsavoury parts of the world, the more power we are giving to those unsavoury parts of the world. That's why investing in cleaner, greener energy, homegrown energy, it's not only good for national security, it's good for the environment as well. Seems a no brainer to me, to be honest. Yeah, but also long term solutions that you're suggesting there. So Vanessa's question, I think, would be that in the short term, at least, there's probably going to be some fuel price rises they're talking about at the pumps, Vanessa. So um, keep save your coppers, everybody. Who knows what will happen next uh, with sanctions against Putin? Perhaps we'll block him on Twitter or send him a stern letter. Maybe his uh, party invite will be rescinded. Who knows? We'll leave it up to Boris Johnson to decide, won't we? I'm sure that would be a great idea. Now, moving on to an issue uh, which Mr Putin has already resolved for his people, and uh, which is recognition of the men who served at the nuclear tests in the Cold War. Now, on Monday's show, we discussed Andy Burnham's call for a medal and national apology for these men uh, in the UK. And on Tuesday, the government brushed it all off at noon, and at three o'clock, the Defence Secretary, you turned in the House of Commons and said a medal was under review. Here is a clip of what happened. Andrew Gwynn. Yeah, yeah. The UK is now the only atomic nation with no official recognition or compensation to nuclear test veterans and their families. Ahead of the 70th anniversary of the first British nuclear test later this year, will ministers now do the right thing and give these veterans the recognition they deserve? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I hear what the Honourable Gentleman says, and I absolutely recognise that we are now the only country to do so. The, the, recent, the, the last internal review was in December. I've asked officials to go back and look at that again. Now, uh, this was actually in yesterday's paper, Luke, but we're going to discuss it today because this is my damn show, and I get to see what we're doing. Um, and I've been reporting on the test veterans for 20 years, and to me, that looked... Um, like quite a moment. Was it a significant change of tack from the government? Was this something we should be excited about or is it? Yeah. Well, I hope so. We need to see it eventually produce not only the recognition for our nuclear veterans, but also the compensation that they deserve. And it's worth remembering that 70 years ago, the United Kingdom exposed many of our armed forces to those first nuclear tests to understand the effect of nuclear weapons on people uh, and on armed forces nearby. Now, the UK, unlike many of our uh, allies, has never compensated or recognised the sacrifice of those uh, veterans. And that means not only 
uh, the impacts on their own health. For many of those veterans, their significant exposure to radiation has also led to consequences for close family members and their children. So that's why it just seems really dumb that the UK government has been denying not only a medal to those uh, uh, nuclear veterans for their service, for their exceptional service 70 years ago, but for the compensation. And Labour has been uh, campaigning on this for quite some time. And I think the Mirror's done an absolutely st a stellar job in continuing the pressure here, giving a voice to those nuclear veterans for whom, um, in many cases, time is running out or time has run out for so many of them, deny, uh, you know, with many of them dying without that recognition or the compensation for them themselves and their families. We need to keep the pressure up on here because I think the government is turning on this one. But until those veterans get the recognition they need and until they get the compensation they need, this campaign must continue because it seems it's not only the right thing to do, it's something that's really significantly important to be a nation that says, we value our veterans, not just in warm words that's said in the House of Commons or in press releases, but in action. And until the action happens, I'm afraid warm words aren't enough. So let's keep that pressure on, keep the campaign going. But well done to everyone at the Mirror for, for their work on this over many, many years. I know you've been working it for a very long time. We're not yet, not yet there, but we're nearly there. Let's keep going. Yes, fingers crossed. Hopefully uh, not much further. But this is where the Labour Party political broadcast ends, Luke, because there is a bit of good news in the world. Uh, and here it is. Now, this is on to someone who has got a medal. No questions asked. And we do not begrudge him that one bit, which is a short haired German pointer called Hertz or Hearts, depending on how you want to pronounce it hurts I think who served with the RAF at Camp Bastion in Afghanistan now he was trained and this is amazing to me as a dog owner to sniff out electronics of all things and he found sim cards data sticks circuitry all sorts of worrying stuff he's been awarded the Dickin medal the animal equivalent of the Victoria Cross for his work which has saved thousands of lives and obviously put him in danger he's happily retired now but Luke isn't it the case? Dogs like Hertz are just as vital a part of our armed forces as the men and women that they protect. And isn't it a great shame on this, uh, well, stain on this country in a way that they have to be awarded a medal by a charity, by the PDSA in this case, and didn't even get a sausage from the Queen that they were serving? What will Labour do differently <laughs> to dogs like Hertz? Well, I mean, what an amazing animal. I mean, every single day, there are thousands of service animals uh, who are supporting our armed forces, many of them in roles that are dangerous. You know, they're not just guard dogs guarding a base. They're sniffing out explosives or drugs or weapons or ammunition or improvised explosive devices, which is one of the things that this dog was sniffing out. You know, isn't it wonderful that we've got our, our, our animal friends supporting us here? But let's also recognise the work that they do, because... It, we, we would not be able to keep our armed forces safe. We would not be able to challenge the terrorists uh, and our aggressors if we didn't have them alongside, because I'm not sure about you, but I couldn't sniff out any of those uh, if there was one hidden right in front of me. And that's why those animals and their incredible senses are so important. Um, I think as a country, we are a nation of animal lovers. We've got more to do on animal welfare, but let's recognise those incredible animals that support our armed forces. I think there would be full support from the country for doing so, but well done to that charity for stepping up and doing something that the official recognition system couldn't do. Uh, but we are a nation that's proud of animals like Hertz and good on that dog for doing everything to keep us safe. Let's get more yes. recognition for that work and keep the investment in. So not only are we looking after those animals when they're serving, but also they go to a good home when they're finished serving as well. Exactly. But I think if you ask the Queen, Luke, she would want to give them a biscuit. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you get hand fed chicken every day. Now, I just have a couple of questions before we wrap. Georgie, I think it is, says, why are we getting so involved in Ukraine? Do you fear World War Three? This is what Joe Biden has warned about, Luke, that if we start getting too itchy about this, if we argue with Putin about the Donbass and say, no, no, you've got to give it back or send troops in, that we're looking at World War Three, and nobody wants that. These are nuclear weapon armed countries we're discussing now. Um, so we, we're going to have to let him have Donbass, aren't we? No, we should never accept an aggressive, uh, a war of aggression from Putin on this one here. This is, this is actually how you preserve peace, by saying to aggressors, no, you will not be able to 
uh, invade at will and land grab. This is not the 19th century imperialism that saw European powers carve up the world, ignoring the rights of people in those countries. This is uh, a, a 21st century nation, uh, uh, nation in, in, in Ukraine who are saying, we have a freedom and a right to exist. We have a right to choose our own government, not to have one forced on us, not to be constantly under cyber attack and dark arts operations. Uh, and those kind of like really dirty tactics that are deliberately designed to wear us down. Now, you know, this might be happening hundreds of miles from us, but this affects Britain. This affects the world in which we live in, and we should be standing up for our allies. As a country, we've had this incredibly proud history of doing what's right, of supporting people against aggression. Now, I don't want UK forces committed to Ukraine, and the government and the Labour Party has been clear that none of us would be doing so. But let's also be absolutely clear that where we do have a military commitment, where we do have uh, NATO commitments, our defensive alliance to deter aggression, uh, which in particular protects those uh, European countries that many of us have visited, many of us have friends and family in, and, and of whom we have many citizens in the UK from, that we will defend them, not just uh, with warm words, but with our military might, because what Putin doesn't want is a war with the West. That's not what he wants because he would not win that war with the West. He wants to be able to get away with ever so gently expanding his, uh, his areas of control, moving the Russian border to get back to where it was under the Soviet Union. But that is wrong. You know, it should be for countries to decide their own fate, for sovereign democratic nations around Russia to choose which way they want to look, who they want to make alliances with and what freedoms their people should enjoy. Being invaded and put under what is effectively a military dictatorship is not good for them, it's not good for us, because the more that Russia gets away with it, the more other countries will want to get away with it as well. And that is something that Britain and our proud international role, we must never accept, we must never excuse. And sadly, there's been too much of that in recent years, and people going, well, perhaps they can have a little bit. I've never heard of that place. Let's let them have that as well. No. We make a stand up for what's right. We make a stand for democracy, for decency. And that's why we are backing our friends in Ukraine. That's why we will continue to back our friends in Ukraine, not only with uh, financial resources, not only with training, but also with the military assistance that we've been providing in, for instance, providing anti-tank weapons uh, to the Ukrainian military. Ukraine will fight for their freedom. We fought for freedom in the past. We know what that struggle means. We should stand with them 100% and not allow Putin an inch of extra territory. Yes. Uh, the Falkland Islands, remember everybody, and the right to self-determination. Ukrainians do not speak Russian. They speak Ukrainian um, for a very good reason, which is they are a country of their own. And also there's some sort of news as well coming out of Russia that maybe uh, Putin has stopped listening to his generals and is slowly losing his mind. Not positive, perhaps, if you worry about the nuclear weapons, but... Maybe it indicates there'll be a coup at some point. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Get rid of him, get someone worse in. Anyway, thank you, Luke, for joining us. Um, thank you for your support for the nuclear test veterans. Join us again on Monday, everybody, for another edition of the News Agenda. Bye-bye.